My name is Sarah and I'm a licensed architect here in California. If you're starting a building project here in California or anywhere else in the US for that matter, then you're probably wondering, how do I actually begin a code analysis? What are the steps involved? Or maybe you're getting ready to take an architecture exam soon, all about building codes. Or maybe you're a student in architecture school and you're trying to figure out late night in studio, how do you actually apply your building codes to your own project? Well, this video is for you. We're gonna go through step-by-step, step, the Cliff Notes version, how do you solve the codes for your own building and a framework for how to begin thinking about these kinds of things. The first step begins with a zoning code analysis. Zoning laws equate to the quality of life in neighborhoods across cities and countries. In the US, most zoning laws will not allow people to live in neighborhoods where there are factories and for obvious reasons. The zoning codes help protect property values and your and my right to have access to ubiquitous universal things such as air and sunlight for all. Whether you're altering an existing building or you're building a new construction project, you must begin by researching the zoning requirements for your own property by accessing the zoning laws in your planning department's authority having jurisdiction or AHJ. You can get information for all kinds of things such as the setbacks, the building height, zoning overlays, how many stories and things like that. Most cities and counties have an online database nowadays where you can just insert your address for your property and learn all kinds of facts about your property straight from the database. Or in other cases, you can just go straight to the planning department in person and talk to a local planner and get the information that way, whichever you're comfortable with. If you'd like to learn how to do a zoning analysis yourself and where to begin with that, I will place a link here in the video and also in the description below for a video that I created, actually a comprehensive tutorial on how to conduct and begin a zoning research. And the example that I provided is for the city of LA, but you can also apply that example to your own city or county. Step two is to figure out major site elements, like what are all the ways to access your building from the public right of way? And how wide do these paths need to be accessible or not? And how do you get from a parking or loading zone to the entrance of your building? There is a lot that goes into it to even just uh, how much water can I retain on my site given the soil conditions? And these are questions that the civil engineer is also asking. As an architect, you must not leave these questions to other consultants, as many think is the case. As architects, we have to understand just as much about these topics as our consultants in order to best inform the final outcome of the site plan, because it is up to us to design every single part of that site plan. So we must understand it just like our consultants. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and consider giving a super thanks of any amount. I'd really appreciate it. It helps the channel greatly. Thanks again, and let's continue. Step three in a code analysis is to figure out what the intended use of the building will be. This is found in the building codes, either IBC or CBC, whichever one you're referring to in chapter three, which is called occupancy classification and use. To identify the occupancy of your building, you're gonna ask yourself questions such as, who is using the building and for what purpose? This will determine all the other aspects of the building type, including the construction, the occupant safety, the fire protection systems that you're gonna to need to the interior finishes and even more. I will link a three-part video that I created here and also in the description below, which will discuss in detail what each of the occupancies are in chapter three. You're probably also wondering, can you have multiple occupancies? Certainly you can have a mixed use occupancy building and that becomes even more complicated. And what I will say in the scope of this video is that you can certainly figure out what the other occupancies are and based on certain area, uh, restrictions and what occupancies are going to be adjacent to one another, that will trigger certain requirements, maybe additional fire resistance and things like that. 
So just know that, yes, you can do mixed use occupancies, but it gets a little more complicated potentially. Mixed use occupancies are referred to in chapter five, starting in section 508. The code section can change over time. So always reference the latest code in your state. And at the time of this video being recorded, the IBC was in the 2024 cycle and CBC 2022. Step four is to identify the construction type of the building in your code analysis. You're gonna start by asking yourself, what is this building made out of? What materials? How do these materials come together to create assemblies? And where are these assemblies and materials found? In the building, are we gonna have sprinkler systems or not? Depending on the materials and assemblies used and where they're used in the building, the construction type will determine a lot of key things about your building from how fire resistive your building will be and its elements. So chapter six establishes five types of construction and each type is either protected or not protected. Depending on the type of construction and the specific building element, the fire resistance can be anywhere from one to three hours. In table 601, the fire resistance rating requirements for building elements is provided in hours for each type of construction. Then section 602 discusses what each type from type one through five construction requires. For example, type five construction is the least fire resistive and type one is the most fire resistive. Table 601 has an A or B if you look closely. The A means protected. That means that element has an additional means of fire protection like having a steel column with application of intumescent paint, which is supposed to add additional fire protection. However, B means non-protected. That means the column is just a column, it's bare, there's nothing applied. Step five is to locate your building on the property for maximum safety at this point in your code analysis. In architecture school, sometimes it seems as simple as building a model and placing it somewhere on your site plan. But where you place it matters a lot. Why? Well, from a code perspective, fire hazard is much greater when buildings are closer together or close to the property line. If buildings are closer than the prescribed limits, then the code can require more fire resistance, limited openings and exterior walls, and even limiting the building area and building height. If a building is on fire, the code wants to limit that fire from spreading to other buildings around it. So to begin this step, start with what the code says as far as how far the building must be from the property line and from other buildings. And the place to begin this is in chapter seven, where fire resistance ratings are given for exterior walls and based on their fire separation distance to other buildings or to a property line such as those provided in table 705.5. Then in table 705.9, this should be consulted for the maximum area of exterior wall openings that are based on fire separation distance. You're starting to see just how tricky and how many layers there are to a code analysis. There's never a straightforward answer. You have to compare all the parts of the code and put the pieces together to figure out what you can really build. With your building located on the site, the next step is step six, which is where you determine just how large, how tall, and how many stories your building can be at this point in the code analysis. Smaller buildings present less of a fire hazard from an egress perspective. Larger buildings present a greater fire hazard. Make sure you compute all the floor areas accurately and compare your calculations to the code allowance while ensuring that you're following setback requirements. Some cases will allow for your building area to be increased, which many architects use to balance the needs for a larger building while maintaining enough open space around the building. Area, height, and stories will all depend on whether your building is sprinklered or not, the occupancy type and the type of construction the place to begin is chapter five, table 504.3, which lists the allowable building height in feet above grade plane. 
the height of a building influences its potential hazard. There are some cases where a building height can be limited even where the code allows it based on the local fire marshal's ability to fight the fire. Maybe the fire marshal doesn't have a large enough truck. Zoning laws or even the fire marshal will have the final say, always more stringent, not less stringent than the code. Then table 504.4 lists the allowable number of stories above grade plane, which is the same issue as discussed with building height. Table 506.2 lists the allowable area factor for how large your buildings can be. In all three of the aforementioned tables, you'll notice that buildings which are sprinklered allow for a taller in height, more in stories, and a larger building in general. If you look at these tables for a minute, you can see patterns emerging with the principles that you're learning. Pretty cool, huh? The next step is step seven, where you determine the occupant load for each room, area, or space in your building. The question that we're asking here is, how many people will occupy each room to determine the number, spacing, and the size of exit doors? If you're using the IBC or the CBC, table 1004.5, you'll get the maximum floor area allowances per occupant in each space, dependent on its intended use. And this is not to be confused with overall building occupancy classification. And I say that because this was one of my confusion areas when I first started, started learning the code as a student. But for things like a director's corner office in an office building, let's say it's a B occupancy building, but we're trying to figure out how many people can actually occupy that director's office. And let's say the director's office is 300 square feet. If we look at how a business area is classified in table 1004.5, then it provides 150 gross square feet for business areas. And at that point, what we would do is take the 300 square feet divided by the 150, and we get a maximum of two occupants or essentially two desks that you can place there to be occupied, most likely gonna be the director in their office. The IBC or the CBC occupant load is often much higher than the actual occupant load. But now you know, every time you see an occupancy sign in a space, here's where it comes from, this table. It's about getting people out in an emergency. That is the point of all of this. Step eight is all about egress. In this step, you're calculating how wide corridors are, how wide stairs need to be, um, elevators, or figuring out the number of spaces allowed to exit through before you reach a protected exit. You're calculating how far your nearest exit can be from the most remote point of a room in a building. You will eventually learn to become best friends with chapter 10, and it will help you design all three portions of the egress system, namely the exit access, the exit and the exit discharge. Chapter 10 is the egress chapter. In the next step, step nine, you'll begin to calculate plumbing fixture counts. Calculating things like how many water closets, how many urinals, how many lavatories, how many sinks, how many drinking fountains. Similar to 1004.5 for the occupant load factors for each room, here's a key point that I would take note of is that with the plumbing code, it uses a different occupant load factor than the occupant load factor found in 1004.5. CPC chapter four, section 422 has all the minimum number of required fixtures. To calculate it, you need a reference table 422.1, the fixture count, and table 4-1 for the occupant load factor. And you will definitely need to know your construction type and your occupancy type before you get to this step, which you would have already calculated. Step 10. Even though I've labeled step 10 as the accessibility step, you're actually gonna solve accessibility at each step, from the site to the building, to the egress, to the plumbing fixture counts and everything else. Accessible requirements will affect everything from the public right of way route to access your building, to the height of casework and accessible toilet stalls. And the list is too long to review in this short video. You'll be referring primarily to chapter 11A if it's a residential project and chapter 11B 
for accessibility to public buildings and public accommodations and commercial buildings. These laws apply to existing buildings that are undergoing renovation, alteration, or additions. And in addition to Chapter 11A or B in California, the accessibility chapters in your state must be complied with, but you also need to comply with the Federal Accessible Guidelines or the Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines, also known as ADAG or A-D-A-A-G, which is produced by the Federal Access Board. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. And finally, step 11. This step is the step that says, there's a thousand more things you need to consider that's outside the scope of this video, like structural requirements found in chapter 16, or glazing requirements found in chapter 24, and the list goes on and on. You'll need to complete all these other steps though, the ones that I've listed from one through 10, as the most important and critical to do correctly at the very beginning of your project, and then everything else will follow. Building codes are generally not retroactive, meaning that they apply to new construction or renovations, starting from the date that the code goes into effect, rather than to existing buildings that were constructed under previous codes. However, if you're performing a significant renovation or alteration, then you may have to bring the entire structure up to current codes. Local building officials might require upgrades to meet current codes, even if no major renovations are planned, simply because a building poses a safety hazard of some sort. The local jurisdictions may have specific rules that can impact how codes are applied to existing structures, so it's essential to check with the local building authorities. Let's review. Question one, what is the occupancy type of an open parking garage? Question two, do all structural steel construction types need protection? And see if you can figure this one out on your own. It wasn't specifically covered in this video, but it's a good question to think about. Finally, question three, how do we specify when a construction type is rated versus non-rated? And does a non-rated construction type mean that the building is combustible? If not, provide an example and you can reference chapter six for construction types. Thank you for watching. If you've liked this video, then I think you will enjoy a video that I will link here all about zoning codes and another one all about building codes and how they work.